I want to call your attention um, back to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And there are a few verses that I want to highlight um, to you this this morning. I tell them I'll call them right back. It's verse 45, 46, um, and verse 47. You'll find words similar to these. It says that David replied to Goliath. David replied to Goliath. He was talking to the giant, the giant that represented breakthrough. He's talking to David. And he says to his giant, he says to this breakthrough experience, you come to me with sword, with spear, and with javelin. But I, he says, come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. He's talking to the giant. He says, verse 46, today the Lord will conquer you. This is what he's saying to the giant, y'all. Nine foot tall, undefeated. He has defeated many of uh, the Israelites, the greatest warriors that were sent out to fight him. He has already defeated them for 40 days. He has been in the valley of Eli and he's defeating all of the people and he's they're about to now take over the Israelites and ultimately take over Bethlehem. And right now he's talking to the giant and he's telling him today the Lord will conquer you and I will kill you and I will cut off your head and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Y'all missing y'all shout. In verse 47 it says and everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people but not with sword but not with spear, for this is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. This is the Lord's battle, not mine. I'm here. I'm standing in front of you. It appears as though I'm fighting you, but this ain't my battle. This is the Lord's battle. And because this is the Lord's battle, he is the one who is going to deliver you into my hand. And if you know anything about this, this story or this real life narrative, after this, the giant then decides to laugh at him and begins to approach, encroach David. And then David, for some strange reason, everyone thought he was foolish, a fool. He has this stick and he has a stone. And you know the story, but I got to make sure that you are reminded. And he takes this this stick and this stone and he slings it many, many yards away. And with one sling, with great accuracy, with great precision, he hits this giant in the head and the giant falls face down and the giant is defeated. Not with the sword, not with the sword of, of Saul who tried to put on his armor. He said, look, I'm the king. Take my armor, take my sword, and I want you to go and fight the giant. But then David says, no, I can't 
walk around. I can't fight in your armor. It fits you. It wasn't made for me. I hadn't had a chance to test it. I hadn't had a chance to practice with it. And because I hadn't practiced and proved, the Bible says prove, since I have not proven this to be worthy and trustworthy, meaning I had not practiced, I had not spent time with it, I'm just going to go with my stick and my stone. And he goes out and he defeats his giant. And last week we talked from the subject, Goliath must fall. But there's still some things that were there that I needed to make very crystal. And this year the Lord has been challenging me to make sure that I don't move too fast, that you miss the principle. So I got to make sure that I don't move to get to the next uh, subject or the next sermon and make and not make sure that you don't fully understand what's at stake in the text that we're in. Let me help you. For nearly for nearly 100 years, everybody say 100 years. The British cycling team. They had only won one gold Olympic medal in almost 100 years. Only one gold medal. And then on cycling's biggest stage, what they call the Tour de France, in 110 long years, the British had been winless. 110 years, they had not won one championship of the Tour de France. And in almost 100 years, they had only won one gold medal in the Olympics. They were so sorry and so mediocre that one of the top bike manufacturers in all of Europe would not sell them a bike or any merchandise out of the fear that if other professionals saw them using their products, that their sales would be hurt. So in 2003, the governing body that supervises the professional cycling team in Great Britain, they decided to make some changes. And so this is what they decided in 2003 after 100 years of just mediocrity. They decided that they were going to hire a man by the name of Dave Brailsworth. And they hired him as its new performance. Are y'all listening? They hired, him as, they hired him as their new performance director. And when they hired him and his team, their ultimate goal was this. We just want to find 1% improvements in overlooked and unexpected areas. They hire this performance director. And when he comes on the scene, he inherits mediocrity. And what he says, him and his team, is that we're just going to find 1% improvements in unexpected and overlooked areas. And so this is what they started doing. You don't have to know anything about cycling or bicycles, but this is what they did. The first thing they did, they redesigned the bike seats so that they were more comfortable. They they rubbed alcohol on the tires so that they can have more grip. They asked the riders to begin to wear this electrically heated overshorts so that their muscles could remain in ideal temperatures. Then they, they, they use biofeedback bio sensors to monitor, to monitor how each individual athlete responded to a workout. Keep on going. Keep on going. I'm going somewhere with this. They switched their racing suits. The people who were outside, they used inside racing suits because they were lighter and more aerodynamic so that they can move faster. Then they, they used different massage gels to discover which one led to faster muscle recovery. They hired a surgeon to show them how to wash their hands so that they wouldn't get sick. Somebody said, are you serious? Yeah, no, that, That's why I'm preaching this message. They changed out pillows and mattresses of the riders so that they can get a better night's sleep. 
increases or 1% improvements in unexpected and overlooked areas so that they could find a way to just get better in little ways. Everybody say tiny improvements. Five years after being hired, 2003, in the Olympic Games in Beijing, 2008, the British won 60% of the gold medals. I keep on going. Four years later, while in London, they set nine Olympic records, seven world records. Over the next six years, they won five out of six Tour de France's. Between 2007, 2017, the British cyclists, they, they were regarded on going on the most successful run in cycling history. How so? They won 178 world championships in 10 years, 66 gold medals, five Tour de France's. Now, here's, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Most people, they didn't know that the British were doing this hard work behind the scenes. Most people, we saw the breakthrough in 2008, but we didn't recognize the been through in 2003, 4, 5, 6, and 7. I gave you your message. Your message, you can go ahead and go home. We saw them show up in 2008. We saw them win uh, these Olympic gold medals and set these records. And we thought that was the breakthrough. But we didn't recognize that they had made these changes, small changes, consistent changes behind the scenes over a long period of time. And they were consistent with it. That was the real breakthrough. I told you last week there was a concept by this expert in building habits, James Clear, who suggests this principle of tiny improvements. He suggests that the most effective way to experience transformation is to make small incremental changes over a long period of time instead of what we tend to do on January the 1st. We decide that we want to make the big changes over the short period of time, and by January the 14th, all of our goals are out the window. I'll keep talking to myself. The principle that we're trying to, I'm trying to communicate that real transformation does not happen overnight, contrary to what people told us. Real transformation in your relationship, in your personal life, on your job, in your career, in your spiritual life, it does not happen overnight. It happens over time. It begins with the decision. Everybody say decision. decision. But the real catalyst here, 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 here. The real catalyst to transformation or the real catalyst to how you experience transformation is based on how you steward your time. The real catalyst to how you experience transformation in your life is how you steward your time in private. I know we're looking for something very supernatural. I'm going to say it again because somebody needs to get this. Because if you don't get this principle, which is why we're back here today. The real way that you experience transformation in your life is based on how you steward your time in private. Time management is a spiritual discipline. Time management is a spiritual discipline, and one who is most effective in the kingdom of God is one who has mastered their calendar. Time management is a spiritual discipline. And you want to know, well, if you're talking about James Clear, how are you talking about James Clear in the Bible? You need to understand if you're going to be effective in the kingdom of God, if you're going to really enact change, if you're going to really be able to operate in your purpose, you have to master your calendar and not allow your calendar to master you. 
I, I look, all I need is just one person to help me. That's all I need. I all I need is one person. I appreciate you. Because what we discover is that time will multiply whatever you feed it. If you feed time in consistency, it's going to produce in consistency. Time is an incubator. It will give back to you whatever you give it. David, for those who don't know, we see him show up on the scene. He kills a giant. He's the overnight hero, overnight sensation. But I told you last week, and it will behoove for me to tell you again, that David started out a full-time shepherd boy. Then he got hired part-time in the palace to work for King Saul as the one who would play the harp for him. He was doing so well that he was promoted to a full-time job, an armor bearer. So he had been promoted to be a full-time armor bearer for King Saul. So now he's a part-time shepherd boy for his father. To make things just a little bit more complex, he has seven older brothers. Three of them are working in the army. So every day he has to take a day's journey and he has to go there and he has to give them food. And he has to wait for them to eat. And then he goes back home. And then he has other brothers that he has to take care of to make sure that matters are not any more complex. He has a father, the Bible teaches us before this passage, who is aging, who he has to take care of. He has a full-time job, a part-time job. He has to take care of his older brothers who are overlooking him. He has to take care of all of them and his father. And somehow, some way, he has managed to increase himself in warfare and worship. I'll come back again. I got to draw the picture. He has so many things pulling at him that we would consider to be important. Your father is aging. Your brothers need you. The, the sheep need to be tended to and you have a full time job for the king and still you have time while you're with the sheep to be on the other side of the mountain shooting your shot with the sling. He didn't just wake up. He didn't just come out the gate knowing how to sling his or swing his slingshot. He didn't just know how to play the harp because he he was anointed. Anointing didn't give him the gift. He had to practice at that. And so he's playing the harp for the king. He's doing all these things. How in the world can you have a full time job, a part time job? Father pulling at you, your brother's pulling at you, all these things going on in your life and you still steward your time well. I'm trying to talk to somebody in here. David didn't waste time. It's a spiritual discipline because God gives you something. We have a responsibility to steward it well. God gives you time. And because God gives you time, you have to steward your time well. On the other side of the mountain, I could be on my mobile device scrolling through social media or I could be investing in ways so that I can become better. I just, just make sure I'm saying what I need to say. Get this. You don't get to arrive to the breakthrough and expect for the giant to fall if there hadn't been pre-work. He arrives to the giant and he approaches the giant and he has a word for the giant. Everybody, everybody with me. He approaches to the battlefield. He looks the giant in the face and he says, you come to me with a sword, a spear, a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies whom you have defied. And he says, today the Lord will conquer you. He goes on and he says, look. Everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people. He comes to the giant with a word. 
He knows that the Lord rescues his people because when you read the text, he fought a few lions and a few bears. His life was at stake and he knew that God rescued him. He had some experiences. He comes to the Lord. He comes to the giant with a word. You can't have a word if you hadn't had an experience. And you can't have an experience if you don't have time. Oh, you missed it. All right. Bag up. He approaches, he stands in front of the giant, and he has a word to give the giant. My God will defeat you because I've been spending time with him. See, when my brothers were asleep and my father was asleep, I get up in the morning and I sing worship to my father all morning when everybody else was asleep because that was the only time I had. I've been with the Lord in private. When I was on the other side of the mountain, when the sheep were around, I was shooting my shot and I was playing the harp because I was becoming stronger. I've spent time with the Lord. And when I, my life was at stake and I almost died, he brought me through. I know my God will deliver me. See, I need some people who you know that you, you're not supposed to be here right now. Some people who know that God will provide because there have been some things in your life, some times in your life when you knew you couldn't do what you have and couldn't have what you have right now if it were not for the Lord. And so he's able to stand in front of his giant and he's able to speak a word to the giant because he's already had experiences with the Lord. We want encounters and experiences with God, but we don't have time. He excelled at time management. And until you learn how to excel in the area of time management, you won't be able to experience the Lord the way you want him to. I know we say, Lord, we want you to come. I want to encounter you, but I only have five minutes in the day for you to do what you need to do. Lord, I really want to experience you this year, but when I look through my calendar, I got a whole lot going on. I got work. I got, I, got, I got family. I got a lot. And so really, if you're going to do what you need to do in my life, can you just fit within these few parameters that I have? We want God to move, but we don't want to move things around on our calendar. Now, you see, you see. That's why I like Exodus 24 with Moses. That's why I like Exodus 24 with Moses. Because the Bible teaches in Exodus 24, and I don't like to always go to other passages while I'm preaching one passage. But what I like about that passage is that the Bible says that Moses ascended the mountain. He went on top of the mountain while all the children were down at the base of the mountain. He ascended to the top of the mountain, and he was up there in the clouds by himself with the Lord. And he was up there for a period of time and the people were getting impatient, but he was up there in the mountain receiving a word from the Lord. He was in the mountain in the clouds with the Lord for 40 days. He was in the clouds on the mountain with the Lord for 40 days. Y'all going to get it in a minute. He was up in the mountain in the clouds by himself with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. And after he spent time with the Lord, I'm not going to give you a time limit. I'm not going to say, God, you need to move now. I'm just going to sit in your presence and let you do what you do. And I work everything else around you. And he's in the mountain for 40 days. And this is what happened. When you're in the presence of the Lord, he comes down when he descends from the mountain. He descends from the mountain with two tablets, the Ten Commandments. He now has a word for the people because he spent time with the Lord. He can't spend time with the Lord if he's not excelling in the area of time management. He's in the clouds for 40 days. And when he finishes spending time, that is when he gets the word. You want a word, you need a word, but you can't have a word if you hadn't had experiences. 
You will not have experiences if you don't have time. And your time won't change until you start modifying it. So the question we ask, how do I excel in the area of time management? You ask wonderful questions. <laughs> because in order to master your time, you don't need to develop any more goals. You need to develop more systems. Because see, we stopped here yesterday and said, no, nah, see, I want to go to, to, to Eli and Samuel. I got, a, I got a brave word to preach, but no, nah, we had to come back here because I can tell you that David excelled in the area of time management. That's how he killed his giant, not because he had the supernatural abilities, not because he was so gifted. No, nah, it's because he excelled in the area of time management and he practiced his precision, and that's why he killed his giant. But we're here, so how can, like David, how can I excel in the area of time management? Don't set any more goals. You need to work on your systems. Goals set the direction. Systems set the progress. Systems help you to conquer your goals. Goals just give you direction. We got a whole lot of goals. See, everybody has a goal to win the championship. Nobody goes into the championship game saying, I just want to come in second place. Everybody with me? You, everybody has the goal to be spiritually mature. Everybody has a goal to want to read their Bible. But see, just because you have a goal doesn't mean you get to accomplish it. Don't develop any more goals. Goals set the direction, but the systems is what gives you the progress. I need you to build the systems. If you aren't accomplishing your goals, if you aren't excelling in time management, it's not because the goal is wrong. It's because your system is broken. And so I, so I, so I need a couple of people to say, okay, okay, okay. If I want to help this relationship, I know we said we want the relationship to be better. So it's more than just saying we want it to be better. But how am I going? How are we going to establish a system? If I'm going to do what God has called me to do, yes, I know that is my goal. But what is your system to conquer that? I'll help you. Let me help. Let me help. Let me help. Let me help. So, so for me, so for me, right? I say, this year, 2019, I want to experience God in a supernatural way. That's my aim. Now, I, 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 want, I want something different. I want something more. So, yeah, I know that's what I want. But just because I want it doesn't mean it's going to come to pass because we just believe, oh, you just speak it. You speak it into existence and it's going to happen. I'm not here to give you that theology. You got a system. And so, so what am I going to do? Let me help you. Carve out more time to worship in God's presence unencumbered. Me, not at church, not with people, for me, at home. So, so this, is, this is my system, my system. And if it doesn't work, then I need to go back and I need to modify my system. I need a better system. If it's not working, make a better system. So if I'm going to encounter God in a supernatural way, I want to carve time out so that my time is uninterrupted and I'm just worshiping in God's presence. Then I'm going to start listening to more worship songs that can help me to focus on God and create a worship atmosphere. That's number two. I'm, I'm going to start because I'm not really a whole, you know, you know, gospel songs, you know, type of guy. And so I got I got I got to change my systems if I want to create this atmosphere and I want this encounter. There's some things I need to do. So I need to start listening to certain types of songs that will help to help me to enter into God's presence and help me to have that moment with them. And then and then. I got to purchase iTunes. <laughs> Follow me before you judge my system. You, know, you, you see the breakthrough, you don't know the been through. So I got to purchase iTunes. I don't want any more bills. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't all them songs, but there's unlimited access to all the songs that I want if I just purchase it for a few dollars a month. All right, so I'm a, I purchased this, so I purchased it. I had all these songs, it's overwhelming, so I got that. So what I need to do is I, 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 now I'm finding or I found a trusted worship leader that many of you don't know. And I say, okay, this is what I need from you. 
I need you to shoot me some suggestions and some songs as they come out because I don't really know songs and, you know, people. I need you to that certain songs that can help me to arrive at a certain place. I don't need a lot of boogity, boogity, boogity. I need something that can get me to that place, something that, 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 that can help me to focus. And then I say, okay, my system, I'm, I'm going to create multiple playlists. Because some days I want a certain experience and some days I just need to be still. I just, I don't need to, I just, I, I don't need, I need different types of experience. I want different types of playlists because my goal, my aim is to experience God in a supernatural way. So I got to create a system that's going to help me to arrive to this place. And then I got to keep a journal of people who I'm praying for intentionally, who I am interceding. See, I pray for people all the time, but no, this is a different type of thing where each day that I open up this journal, I got a journal that just says journal praying for people, and I got their names, and I get their information, and I write it out, and I touch it, and I read every line every time I open it up because I believe that this is one way that I get to experience God in a supernatural way. So when they tell me that God has answered their prayer, I get to go by it, and I get to mark it off. I got to do something different. I got to change my system, right? I got to change my system because I want to experience God, and I'm trying to help somebody in a supernatural way. And so I, this is one of the things that I have to do. Then, then, then I decide, real thing, since I wake up sleepy, I need to start going to sleep at least an hour earlier. I get ugly sleeping patterns. So I wake up sleepy and so, okay, so then you need to decide to start going to sleep at least one hour early. I know people say, why you got to do all that? Does it take all that? Look, I'm trying to change my system because I want an outcome and I can't keep doing things the same way I've been doing them. I say I want this, but I don't want to make any changes. I'm saying if David can conquer his giant, he didn't conquer his giant because he just walked to the battle. He made some changes and some tweaks behind the scene. And so keep on, keep on, keep on. And so here's the deal. Because when I wake up in the morning and the winter is so cold, have you ever just... Open your eyes and it'd be so cold and you like, man, look, I'm just going to stay in the bed. <laughs> I have that I have that face, you know, like, you know, like you you wake up, the alarm go off and you, you it's so cold, cold in the house. You just be like mm, five more minutes, 10 more minutes, two more hours. And so. <laughs> so. I now have to keep the house heated. To a certain degree. So that cool air won't keep me from getting out of the bed, which means that my MLGW bill might. <laughs> that's Memphis light, gas and water. Might be a little more elevated, but when it comes to encountering the presence of God and God in a supernatural way, I'll pay those extra coins. And so and so and so. So 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 if that is not something else, I say, you know, you know, you know. Sometimes the, the, the air might not be a problem. I may have gone the hour earlier, but I still wake up and I'm a little tired. So there's some green tea that I make at night. Go on, heat it up, go on, you know, steep it, and go ahead and put it on the bedside so that when I get up and I just take a few sips of it and just go on get in my system and that can just help me so I have no excuses on getting up and just being still. And so I make sure, no matter what time that I begin my time of worship, that my phone remains on do not disturb. And so I had to go inside of it to make sure that even if you call some of y'all and get smart back to back, that it'll go through. You can't call back to back and get through. If it's on do not disturb, it will be on do not disturb until it comes off of do not disturb. Because I want the time to be unencumbered. I can't look at emails because I went onto my device. And so it's off mode where I can't look at anything. I can't do anything until I activate everything. Because I need to make sure that my time is unencumbered because I need to be intentional with trying to be in God's presence. I can do all of that and then I allow God to handle the rest. What is your system? What are you doing? Yeah, you got your goal. Your goal is just pointing you in the direction. But you're not moving because you don't have a system to make progress. 
Oh, it takes too much thought. It takes too much time. Yeah, it means you got to spend a little less time on social media and think about how you can actually be better. But if you want for God to move in your life and in your situation in a supernatural way, I can tell you a whole, I can tell you to read your Bible and do a lot of praying, but you're still going to have to master your time and stop allowing your time to master, to master you. And so here's the thing. Time itself is currency. Everybody say currency. currency. It's money. It's currency. And, and, and here's the thing. Time is the currency that must be exchanged in order to receive a desired result. It's currency. You exchange that if you want to get a desired result. Where you, where you are next year this time is depending on how you spend the currency of time. It ain't because of my preaching. It ain't because your boss and your job. But if your relationship, your marriage, your personal life, your spiritual life, if it's the same place it is right now next year, it's because of how you spent the currency of time. So here's the question. Your spending habits may be keeping you from accomplishing your vision. I'll, I'll help it make sense. Your spending habits. I know you probably wouldn't expect. You know, you wanted to hear something a little bit more extravagant with, with David. But, but if time is the currency and we got to excel in time management, how this is a spiritual discipline. We're talking about increasing in 2019. And, and I'd be remiss if I just come up here and keep giving you a word after word after word and not help you to steward your time well. Some of us won't be here next week because you didn't steward your time well. Some of us aren't here right now because the time hadn't been stewarded well. Currency. It's currency. And the question is, what are your spending habits like? All right, let me help you. 168 minutes each week. Each week. We get $168. Everybody say 168. Now watch this. We spend about 50 hours each week, where? Work. I don't do math a, a whole lot well, but that would probably put us around 118 hours. Everybody with me? Okay. Let's say this 118. All right. According to statistics, some of us sleep about... 50 more hours sleep, give or take some of us. And that'll put us where? Is that 68? Now, statistics say we spend about 15 hours each week running errands. Everybody say errands. Running errands that'll put us where? 53. Some of y'all running a lot more errands than others. You know, just your errands. Then statistics say that some of us spend about 15 more hours a week with our children. <laughs> That'll put us where? 38. Now, here, here, here. I've already, my job is to think about what you're going to say before you're going to say it. Some people saying, I don't have any children. Some people say, oh, my children are all gone, so that's not an issue with me. <laughs> but you know what they also say? You spend about 15 hours a week at a minimum on your mobile device. So I'll just put that right there. Yeah, I bet you won't argue with me on that. So for those of us who don't have the children that require our 15 hours, the rest of us spend about 15 at a minimum 
about three hours, 25 minutes minimum on our devices each day. So I'm not even calculating what that's times seven. I'm just going to give us 15 hours. Now, God forbid you got children and the mobile device. I'm not even going to add that. <laughs> and then, and then we ha the, the statistics also say that we spend about eight hours. Oh. <laughs> <sighs> At church a week. <laughs> I, know that's, I know that's not some of us holy people in here. But there's some of y'all. Hey, some, some of my folk is like a full-time job, eight hours a week. Just, just for give or take, give or take. That's fine. Just take that off of your mobile device. And so, that, and so that, that'll put us, that'll put us at, at 30, 30, 30 hours for the rest of us. Hold on, just follow me. So they say we spend about five hours. A week with fitness. Some of y'all say, I wish in my mind. <laughs> I give about 30 minutes walking to my car and to my parking lot. <laughs> and that puts us at 25 hours. Then statistics say that we just got miscellaneous stuff. We just, it's just 15 hours of just stuff. Everybody say stuff. That puts us where? That puts us at five. That puts, because this is 25, that puts us at five. It's 15 hours. 15? 10? All right, 10. Everybody know I'm the pastor. I ain't the mathematician. And so they say that we spend five hours a week by itself just on our dreams. You could take that five hours off of that fitness or that stuff. Out of a hundred and 68 hours in a week. We're not even talking about a lot of other things. Only five hours is given to your dreams. You want to know what they say is the biggest opposition to your dream is your job. Ah, uh, y'all, you act like y'all. question is, are you willing to change your spending habits? Five hours or less is giving to things that really increase you. 168 hours in a week. At, at a minimum, one to five hours is given to areas of your life that can actually make you better for the season that you're heading into. More time is spent doing other things, sitting on the couch, watching television, looking at our mobile device, searching the, the social media with people who probably aren't feeding us what we need to be nourished with on our job that we're complaining about most of the time on a job that we've been over with for five, ten years now, but we're still on the job. In a relationship with somebody that we we thinking about somebody else. Oh, I'm not supposed to say, say that. <laughs> but I'm talking to you. Nobody can get in your head. Nobody knows what you're thinking. Nobody knows what's in your heart. But for David, he's able to conquer his giant because he mastered his calendar and he didn't allow his calendar to master him. This area of your life should not be suffering 
because every other area of your life is dominating it. You say that you want God to grow you. You've been praying about God to do some wonderful things in your life. But you've given him less than five hours a week to make that happen. And somewhere in that five hours, you're doing more daydreaming than anything. Do you need to change your spending habits? And if you do need to change your spending habits, how are you going to change them? Don't create more goals. You need to create a better system. You need a better system. Your relationship, your marriage needs a better system. The system is what gives you progress, not the goal. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for David the king. And Lord, today, what we're praying for is the ability to master our time. Help us to be better with our no. Help us to be more responsible with our yes. If we want you to move, if we want you to perform, if we want you to heal, if we want you to open doors, help us to be like David, help us to be like Moses and help us to master and excel in the area of time management. Help us to sit in your presence not just come to church and strike it off the list, but help us to carve time out where we're just in your presence and we're learning and we're just sitting with you. Show us areas of our lives where we can just become 1% better. Reveal areas in our lives that we can just make a tweak. But even when we make the tweak, don't allow us to expect transformation to happen immediately. So, God, I'm asking for supernatural patience. Patience that will allow us to work through the process and trust you along the way. We want a word, a word that can look at our giants and say, our God will defeat you. But, Lord, in order to have that word, we need the experience. And in order to have that experience, we need to master our time. It's a spiritual discipline. And, Holy Spirit, we need you. Convict us in the areas where we need convicting and help us to be responsible. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.